chapter number, uh, let's go to Ephesians chapter number 6. We'll start there uh, this, this morning. Remember, we're dealing with the Christian home and uh, child rearing. And we dealt with the husband and wife relationship. And Ephesians chapter 5, husbands love your wife as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. Wives, submit yourself unto your own husband as unto the Lord. And remember, we told you how to have the secret of a heavenly home upon earth, all right? And what, is a, what is a marriage a picture of? It's a picture of Christ and the church. That's what he says there in Ephesians chapter 5. I show you a mystery. I speak concerning Christ and the church. We talk about the fact that God instituted marriage not just so man would have a help meet, not just so that there would be uh, children born, but God instituted marriage to be a picture of what's going to happen in eternity, salvation. One of these days, the bridegroom is coming to take the bride. We're going to go to heaven. We're going to have the marriage supper of the Lamb. And then we're going to dwell together in a marriage relationship, a spiritual marriage relationship for all eternity. And that's why Christ is why God dealt with the issue of divorce, because divorce was teaching that in marriage you can put away your bride or the bride can put away the bridegroom. And God is not going to do that. When we go to, so shall you ever be with the Lord. Amen. And that's why he says, I don't want you to divorce because divorce teaches a false gospel. The gospel is that Christ is, has, 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 has redeemed me. He's paid the price for the bride. He's gone to prepare the place for the bride. He's coming back to get the bride who's preparing herself for him. And then we're going to get married together in, in heaven, not in a in a sensual or a wicked way, a spiritual way, amen. And then for all eternity, he's going to, I'm going to love him and he's going to love me, amen. Now he says on your home in heaven, here's how you do it. Wives, you submit yourself as unto the Lord. So however you would treat Jesus, however you would submit to Jesus, if Jesus made a request or if Jesus led you, if he was your husband, how would you submit to Jesus? That's the way you should submit to your husband. I know he's not Jesus, amen. I know he's not anywhere close to being like Jesus, but that's how you as a wife are supposed to treat. And then husbands, you're to love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. So as husbands, we're supposed to treat our wives the way Jesus would if that was his wife. So I've been married to Julie for, uh, I'm going to get myself in trouble here, 39 years. 39 years I've been married to Julie, and, and my job is to treat her the way if she, if she had been married to Jesus. I would hope, I know it's not true, but if I'd been the right kind of husband, she, I would, she would be able to say, you know what, I feel like I'm married to Jesus every day. That's the kind of husband I should be, that she should feel like every day I'm married to Jesus. My husband is like Jesus, amen? And then God instituted the home so that... Uh, uh, he instituted marriage so that we could replenish the earth and multiply. Amen? And so that we could keep this thing going for generation to generation. God created man in his own image because God wanted to have somebody he could love supremely. Amen? Somebody he could have relationship and fellowship with. Christ is reconciling us unto God because God loves us. That's why we're a special creation, okay? And even though God knew that we were going to sin... And we're going to end up going to hell, and he's going to have to send his son to die for our sins. God still went ahead and made us, amen, because he wanted to have this relationship. And he made it so that it would be a generational thing. It would keep going on, amen. And so he gives us a responsibility as Christians to make sure that we pass our faith on to the next generation, amen. And so that we teach our children how to be uh, good people, good citizens, and everything the Bible requires. What I like about the Bible is the Bible is not just a book about how to be spiritual, but it's a book how to be how to be a good citizen. It's a book how to be a good employer and a good employee, how to deal with your neighbor. It deals with all aspects of our life. Now, really no area of your life that you can't find instruction for in the Bible. Amen? So if you're having struggle with some area of your life, just go to the Word of God. And so one of the greatest responsibilities, see, God instituted three institutions. He instituted first the home, Genesis chapter number three. He instituted secondly government, Genesis chapter nine and verse six. When man was doing their own thing, finally he said, now if, you, if man sheds man's blood, shall man by, by man shall his blood also be shed. And God instituted government. The main purpose of government is to punish the evildoer and to protect the innocent. 
not to, not to, not to make our lives full of a bunch of laws, amen, and, and not, to, not to provide for us, amen. That's our job and the job of the church to take care of the poor and the needy, amen. So that's, but then God instituted the church. So those are the three institutions that God gave us. But the first one was the home. As I said this, the home is the building block of everything we have. Our church, is, our church is, is as good as our homes are, amen? Our future of our church will be as good as how we train our children to follow our faith. The only thing necessary for Christianity to fail is for one generation. One generation, that's it. My biggest responsibility as a parent is to try to make sure that I pass on to my children a faith in God and a belief in the principles of this book. Amen. Now, my wife and I have raised our children to the point that they all have their own homes. At that point, I am no longer responsible for my children. Now, I'm responsible for how I raise them. I'm responsible for my failures, and I, and I get the rewards for my successes, amen. But the truth of the matter is now, my daughter has a husband. He's her head now, not me. My two sons are now the heads of their home, and so they're responsible for how they lead their wives and their children and what they teach, amen. And so, uh, uh, but, but, but when you're raising your children, it's, it's, it's a difficult situation. It comes at a difficult time in life because you're young. You're trying to build a, uh, your finances, your, 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 your career, and whatever else. And you got all this stuff going on. And it, it's, it's an overwhelming load, amen? And uh, you look forward to the day when it's done. I'll just be honest with you. Somebody said to me when my daughter left, she didn't get married until she was 25, 28. When she left, they said, are you sad to see her go? I said, No. <laughs> I'm not sad to see her go. It's time. Amen. I love her. She can stay here forever, but I'm glad somebody else is responsible for her now. Amen. And, and so I raised my children, let them go. Last week we talked about as arrows in the hands of a mighty man. So are the children of thy youth. And the fact that in that day they didn't get their arrows down at the store, they made them. And so they had to go out and they had to, they had to make that arrow. And that's really what you and I are doing as parents we are making an arrow that we're going to aim at a target. We're going to let it go, and hopefully that arrow is going to hit the target. Amen? Now, if we didn't make a good arrow, we can't expect it to hit the target. However, once it leaves your hand, it may not hit the target because there are factors that can affect an arrow. If any of you do shooting with arrows or if any of you do shooting with a gun, we have distance. We have wind. You can point here, but the wind's blowing from the side at uh, you know, 60 mile an hour. Is that arrow going to hit the mark where he aimed it? And so there are a lot of things that affect the way our children can turn out once they are on their own. Amen? And one of the greatest things that affects our children is the people they run with. Amen. Amen. And one of the things you need to teach your children is how to choose the right types of companions. The Bible tells us about Amnon. Amnon had a friend. And that friend encouraged him to rape his sister. Amen. And it's important about the friends you choose. Amen. You're known by the company you keep. Amen. Uh, evil communications corrupt good manners. You say that word communications, it's talking about the people you run with. Evil companions corrupt good manners. Amen. You know, well, you know, I, I'm strong enough, I can run with that crowd. I've met very few people that are strong enough to run with that crowd. Why God says, come out from among them. Have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. It's even a shame to speak of those things which they do in secret. Amen. Separate. Flee youthful lust. Flee idolatry. Flee fornication. Don't play with it. You play with sin. If a man walks on hot coals, he's going to get his feet burned. Amen. You play with sin, it's going to get you. You've got to learn that. So your children have to be taught that. So Ephesians chapter number 6. Let me get there. You're already there waiting on me, and I'm over here just ranting and raving. Amen. Look at Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 1. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. We need to teach our children to obey us. Children should be brought under obedience, okay? If your children are not obeying you, then you still got work to do, amen? And, and can I tell you this? You can always have work to do, even when they get become grown, I still have work to do with my children. But, but, uh, but I mentioned this last week, and I mentioned it again. Dr. John Storner wrote a book, Growing Up God's Way. 
and he said a child's personality and basic um, character is developed by the time they're at the age of five. And when you wait too long to start training your children to obey, you have a, you have a mess on your hands. If your child is not brought under, under obedience, I'm not talking about they're perfect. Nobody's perfect. And I'm talking about the fact that they, they know that they need to obey. And like I said last year, you know, with my dad, it was he reached right here with his belt. When my dad did that, I knew it was time to obey. Amen? With my kids, I snapped my fingers. If I snapped my fingers, my kids knew. That's it. You need to have your children in the place where when, it's, when, it, when you have that marker, they obey you. Amen? If they continually disobey you, you know, if you do that, I'm going to spank you. If you do that, I'm going to spank you. If you do that, I'm going to spank you. And they just keep doing it. You don't have your child under obedience. Amen. It doesn't mean that your children are perfect. Nobody's children are perfect. Foolishness is bound in the heart of a child. Amen? I mean, they're born with a sin nature. Amen? In sin did my mother conceive me. Amen? I was born with that nature. You don't, if it's natural, you don't have to teach it. If it's not natural, you have to teach it. You don't have to teach a child to lie. You don't have to teach a child to fight and hit and bite and scratch and scream and holler. You, don't, you have to teach them to obey and not bite and not, not lie. Amen. And so that's our job. All right. Well, then go to Proverbs chapter 1 with me and verse 7. We looked at this last week real quickly too, and then we'll, we'll get on. We, Proverbs chapter 1, the book of Proverbs. Chapter 1, and look with me at verse number 7. I'll get there soon. These old fingers of mine don't work like they used to. I cut my thumb on a table saw several years back and don't have any feeling in this thumb. I can't get the pages turned very well. Uh, for Proverbs chapter 1 and verse 7, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. My son, hear the instruction of thy father. Forsake not the law of thy mother, for they shall be an ornament of grace upon thy head and chains about thy neck. He says to his son in verse 7, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. And so we need to teach our children to fear the Lord. We need to teach them to fear the Lord. I'm just going to tell you something. Adults need to learn to fear the Lord. Amen. And we've just gotten to the place where we almost, we almost, in God's face, disobey Him. Because there's no fear. The reason there's no fear is because God's so long-suffering. Because execution of unrighteous deeds not immediately carried out. Men become set or bold in their, in their in iniquity. What happens is, same thing with your children. If they do wrong and there's no consequences, then they have no fear. And when we do wrong and God's so merciful and there's no consequences, then we think, well, I can get by with this. And then we become people who are not afraid of God. We're not afraid that God might send a lightning bolt down. Now, I, I, that's an extreme, okay? That God might not cut our head off or something. You know, I don't believe he does that. I told you last week as a father, like with our pretties on the, on the, on the table, you know, you, you, you correct them word. Don't, don't touch that. We never, we never ch child-proofed our house. We house-proofed our children. Amen? You don't touch that. That's mama's pretties. No, no. If you touch them, I'll slap your hand. And I had slapped their hand, but I did it softly. <laughs> what screaming. But they were right back there again. Amen? And I slapped the hand harder. And then harder, and then <laughs> until it was red. And why did I do that? Because I'm a mean dad? No. But I needed them to understand. They needed to have a fear of touching mom's pretties. And we need to teach our children the fear of the Lord. That God's not going to overlook your sin. God's not going to let you get by with this. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. What's your man's soul? That shall I Now, he's a loving father. As a father pitieth his children, so the Lord pitieth those are him. He remembers our makeup, that we're but dust, just like you as a daddy. Uh, and, and my wife and I, we discuss this a lot of times. My wife is a drill sergeant, okay? I mean, she is. She's tough nut, man. I mean, she's from Chicago, South Side. She's a gangster, amen? And uh, with my kids, I'm telling you, I mean, Man, I mean, they had to toe the line. I'd come and she said, you know what your son did? And I said, how old is he? <laughs> he's only five years of age. I said, I'm not condoning what he did, but, you know, he, he's only five. That's a father pitying his children, amen. I mean, you're a sick daddy if you like the spank. Amen. But you're a, you're a poor daddy if you don't. Amen. When necessary, amen. And so we, we need to teach him fear. There's many things I didn't do as a teenager because I feared my dad. 
I feared my daddy would find out, and I knew the consequences would not be good. Amen. And now God, God's so loving and, and so patient and merciful. Look at the children of Israel, how many times and how long God suffered with them. But we need, to be, we need to be taught by the word of God that our attitude should be one of, I don't want to displease God. I don't, I don't want to try to hide things from God. I don't want to sin against God because I have a fear of God. It's not, it's not just a scaredness. It's a reverence. It's both. It's, I'm afraid of what he can do to me, but I, I have a reverence for my daddy. I'll I, I tell you a story. I, I may have told it to you before, but one day I came home from school. My dad was there. My dad was never home when I came home from school. And when I got in there, he was in the living room. My brother was sitting there. And he said to me, Ted, come in here. We need to talk. And I came in there. And then he looked at my brother, and he said to my brother, he said, when I got to work this morning, on Monday morning, the first thing I heard was you were drinking Friday night at so-and-so's house at a party. Now, we were raised in an independent Baptist home, drinking, teetotaling. That's what I believe in. That's what I was taught. And I know my daddy didn't want me drinking. My brother knew he didn't want me. And, and, and my dad said to my brother that, and he said, is that true? And my brother said, yes. And then my dad, I, my dad is not a crying guy. Now he cries more now, getting older. But at that time, he was hard-nosed, man. And he started sobbing. I mean, literally, shoulders shaking and head just sobbing uncontrollably. And he said to my brother, he said, I can't believe you did that. If you wanted to drink beer, I wish you'd have told me. I'd have bought it. You could drink it in my house. Man, I looked at that, and I sat there, and my heart crushed, and I said, God, I never want to hurt my dad like that. That's a part of that fearing God, that reverence. He's God. I don't want to hurt him. We need to teach our children that. You know, sometimes what our children do in disobedience is cute, but it's not cute for you to let them know it's cute. Sometimes you got to learn to. You got to learn how to have a mean face on the outside when you're laughing on the inside. Amen. Mean that. Brother Walsh used to say to me when I taught school, the Christian school in Festus, he said, Brother Houston, you need to learn how to control your face. And never thought about it much. But he said, everybody can read your face, and your kids can read your face. And you need to get a. You're in trouble face. <laughs> you need to have one of those. They're... My kids, they saw the face. They knew. But we're in trouble. Dad's giving us the face. Amen. You know, I'd rather have the face and the snap than have to pull off the belt. The belt helped me get to the place where I could snap and give them the face and say the word, hey, hey. When I said, hey, they knew, hey. And I don't mean this meanly, but discipline is supposed to be done mostly by dad. Amen. Ye fathers, bring up your children in the nurture, the admonition of the Lord. You're the one who's supposed to be doing that. God didn't make women authoritative. He didn't. They're different. Yeah? yeah. A, a, a woman generally, it, uh, not all, but a woman generally gets emotional. And when, when things start getting crazy, she, her voice starts going up, and it starts getting louder, and that's very ineffective. Kids can shut that out. I showed you last week what they can't shut out. stayed away from the girls. It's a shame you have to do that at Christian camp, isn't it? But we're all, we're all human, amen? And we were walking one day, and he said to me, Brother Houston, he said, the more serious the offense, the lower and softer the voice. And I learned that from a wise man. When my kids were really in trouble, they didn't get yelled at. They got spoken to. Very quiet, almost a whisper, 
very serious, very slow. <laughs> and they were going, they were going. Sometimes I took them by the chin right here. Pull their face up to mine. I said, now you look at me in my eyeballs. If you ever do that again, you are going to get it. By the way, if you say get it, they don't know what you mean. And therefore, you have an open door. If you say you're going to get specific, then you're going to have to do it. Amen. And sometimes, you, as parents, you can back yourself into a corner and force yourself to have to do something that you think later, I wish I hadn't that, that said that because I made myself have to do that. It, that's why you have to be under control when you discipline. Why you don't discipline in anger, you don't discipline when you're mad, you make sure that you get yourself under control. That's why I think I said last week, you send your kids to their room. And you go to a room somewhere. And what I did, go to a room and I'd get on my knees and pray and say, God, I want to do this right. I don't want to go in there angry. I don't want to go in there wrong. I don't want to give them, I want to be fair. I want to be just. God is a fair and just God. We need to be like him. If they deserve a spanking, I want them to get a spanking. I don't want to spank them, over spank them. I want to spank them what's right. And I pray about it. And I make sure you have a control. Sometimes I had to go in a room and laugh for a while before I could get in and do what I need to do. I mean, because Art Linkletter said kids say the funniest things. Amen? Amen. All right, last week we said uh, uh, about the failure to begin training early. The eight pitfalls of dealing with kids and failure to begin training early in Psalm 71. Let's turn back over there and I'll move quickly. Psalm 71 and verse 5 through 8. Psalm 71 verse 5 through 8. For thou art our hope, O Lord God, thou art our trust from my youth. By thee have I been holding up from the womb. Thou art he that took me out of my mother's bowels. My praise shall be continual to thee. I am as wonder unto many, but thou art my strong refuge. Let my mouth be filled with thy praise and with thy honor all the day. David says that God was in impact in his womb. And listen, you need to start early with your children. As I mentioned, Dr. Stormer said by the age of five, and I believe this. I believe by the age of five, your children have basically developed what kind of person they're going to be. As a wise parent, you need to see what that is. And I believe that pre-adolescence train up a child. The word child there is pre-adolescence. Once they become teenagers, you're going to have a tough job. And I, think, I believe this. You get your children under control by about the age of seven or eight, you've got them under control. And not that they're going to be perfect. You're going to have to still discipline. But it's going to be more verbal correction then it's going to be any type of other correction. Amen. And, 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 and spanking is not the only kind of correction, okay? Now, I want you to understand that. I mean, there are a lot of ways. And, and, and some kids, uh, some kids kind of, they're kind of tough, and that doesn't bother them. And so you've got to find something else. And, and I had a young man that just had an anger problem in our church, and he, he was just angry with his mom. He would treat her dirty. I'm not dirty, but uh, un unrespectful. And, and dad, dad wasn't really a strong disciplinary. Dad was kind of a joke around type guy, and he let it go too long. And a uh, pretty bad situation. I mean, we were getting ready to kick him out of our Christian school because he just was disrespectful. His mother was a teacher there, and he'd have these fits of anger with anybody, and he'd lose control. And, and uh, my school ministry said, well, he's gone. I said, no, no, I don't believe. Let's don't throw any kids away. And so I put this kid in my office with me for, I don't know, I, I think it was a couple weeks. Julie thinks it was a month. I don't remember. Every day he sat in the office with me. And every day I just talked to him, and we went to Scripture, and we just, and we just dealt with this thing. And then I, his dad would come in, I'd counsel his dad. And, and that boy today is in a Bible college. He's, he's a fine young man. And it wasn't because we whacked the snot out of him all the time. It was because we realized that he had some issues that we had to address. And a part of that nurture and admonition involves discipline, but it also involves teaching and training and talking to your children. Amen. But start early. Sam, uh, Samuel, five years of age, he's brought to the temp temple, to the tabernacle. 
by his mother. And not one bad thing is said about Samuel. His mom only had him about five years of age. But she, she raised a boy that was exemplary. Moses was only kept in his mother's house until he was weaned. And then he was placed into Pharaoh's university. But he chose to stay a Christian. And nothing is said bad about Moses until he messes up over there and doesn't get to go into the promised land. And so begin early with your children. Now go to John chapter 10. <clears throat> Excuse me. John chapter 10 with me. And let's look at a new one of the pitfalls. The failure to begin training early was the first pitfall. The second pitfall in John chapter 10 and verse 10. <clears throat> look what the Bible says here. John chapter 10 and verse 10. The thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. Number, number two, the failure to understand the spiritual forces at work in your child. Listen, <clears throat> your children, no matter what age they are, there's a devil. Your children, no matter what age they are, they were born with a sin nature. Your children have flesh. Your children can be tempted. They can be influenced by evil. When I was six years of age, my grandmother said to my mother, there's something wrong with that boy. He'll be in prison someday. The reason my grandmother said that, because when I was six years of age, a friend of mine introduced me to a wicked sin at six years of age, which caused me to do something that I don't share with anybody because it's, it's very it's personal. But the truth of the matter is, at six years of age, I was able to be tempted in an area which you would think wouldn't be temptable. We have some kind of idea that children are innocent. No, children are born sinners. They're born in iniquity. Now, they are more innocent as children than we are as adults, but that doesn't mean they're innocent. It doesn't mean that they don't have those passions running inside them, especially rebellion. Amen. Especially anger. Amen. Especially hatred. Amen. It doesn't make them bad. It's just that's the nature. And then you've got this devil over here that loves to do everything he can to destroy every human being. He's a roaring lion walking about seeking whom he may devour. He doesn't play fair. He doesn't, he doesn't care whether they're children or teenagers or adults. It doesn't matter to him. He hates everybody. He wants everybody to have their life destroyed. He wants everybody to go to hell. And by the way, when I was a kid growing up, cartoons were, were probably something you could watch. Not all of them, but we knew they were cartoons. I mean, you had Tom and Jerry, and the cat kept getting the snot beat out of him and kept living. Amen. You had uh, the road runner, and he kept, the coyote kept getting blown up, but he kept living, amen, and you had all that stuff. But I noticed as I got into the ministry in the, in the 80s that the cartoons went to demonic powers and putting out lightning bolts and all this stuff, and our kids are sitting here being, being ingrained with the occult. I mean, well, it's just a harmful cartoon, is it? <clears throat> This is a harmful little Walt Disney show, is it? Walt Disney is not trustable. Amen. You may go back to some of the old stuff, but the new stuff that's coming out, you know, what that mountain, and I don't remember all that stuff. I mean, I just seen once in a while, see an advertisement of that stuff, and you got these kids with these unique powers. And where is that? Where has that got to do with the Bible? All that stuff got to do with the Bible. The uh, Marvel characters, what does that got to do with Bible? I said, oh, those things, I don't know. You need to decide for your child. My wife and I decided that for raising our children, we were getting rid of the TV. We decided that there wasn't much on there that was of value, and we didn't have time to be sitting there and, 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 and uh, you know, uh, what do you call that? censoring everything and so we just got rid of the tv and our kids didn't grow up with the tv okay if we went someplace and there was a tv there they might have watched some things i remember we took them to my folks house one time i said don't be watching tv i gave them three things not to do they did all three of them when we were gone and so i said you don't go to grandma and grandpa's anymore amen and my, my, mom, and my mom and dad i love them but my mom and dad were upset with me but i said look mom and dad they're not your children they're mine 
You raise me the way you want, but I need to raise mine the way I believe God wants me to. You see? And you'll have enemies in your own family to fight the way you want to try to raise your kids. You'll have battles. You'll have battles from the lost on how to raise your kids. You'll have battles from the saved on how to raise your kids. Can I tell you, you ought to get your directions from the book, amen, and you ought to determine for yourself as a couple, this is where we're at. By the way, mom and dad, you need to get in agreement. You must both be in agreement. If you don't, if you have a, if you have a conflict in how the children are raised, you're going to have problems with your children. Amen. Now, you know what? You don't have to always agree, but if you disagree, disagree privately. And don't put it in front of the children. Because if, if, And if you have children do this, Daddy, can I go? No. Where do they run next? Mommy, Mommy can I go? Sure. Oh. You know what our position was? Can I go do this? Did you ask your father? Amen. Yes. What did he say? Does that end it? Mm -mm. They'll lie to you. So then she has to come to me and said, the kids said, you said. Uh, I'd say, well, did, you, what, did, did you ask your mother? Yes. What did she say? I say, Julie, did you tell the kids? You know what we did? We removed that. They knew they couldn't play that game. Now, if, 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 if one of us said that, we had a conflict, the other one wants to do it. And sometimes we had to tell the kids, no, you can't go. Well, why? Well, because your mother didn't want you to. And I agree with her. Amen. But you know, uh, 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 and, 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 and when a dad is disciplined to children, it's a good thing for the mom to get out of the way. Amen. Amen. Our son is pastoring right now. He was strong-willed. I mean, strong will. I mean, when the boy was young, he would put his head down and he'd walk, and he'd, he'd go as far as he could and crawl it, and he'd hit his head in the concrete wall, and he'd just sit over on his bottom and start laughing. I mean, you couldn't make that boy cry. He just was that kind of kid. Strong will. And one day, I had to have a session with him. I knew if I didn't break his stubbornness, session I knew I had, I had to and so I had to I took him down in the basement and I he would never he would never submit to a spanking so I had to put him over my knee and put this leg over his leg and put this hand on the back of his head and I had to give him a spanking and I had to spank him until he quit fighting me and he went dead and my wife's upstairs <laughs> I shut the door. I'm shutting the door. Don't you come down here. I had to do business with my child. Amen. So there's spiritual forces at work. Here we saw in John 10:10 10, 10, that the, the Satan, the, the enemy, he comes to steal. Steal, to kill, and to destroy. Satan has a strategy to destroy your children. I think there are a lot of them, atheistic teachers. You know, the public school system that I grew up in is not the public school system the kids grew up in. I'm not dissing the public school system. You need to understand something, that they have a, they have a, a philosophical position that's different than what you and I would have as a Christian. It's called humanism. I was a public school teacher. I know what I'm talking about. I was trained to be a humanist teacher. What that means is, is that you don't teach any morals, you just teach facts. And I was the health teacher, and so I was supposed to teach safe sex. And so I did that for a year, 
And then I realized by watching a film called Let Their Eyes Be Open, which exposed humanism, that I was teaching immorality. And humanism teaches there are no absolute rights or wrongs, and you're your own God. And they don't teach morals, they teach values. There's a whole different system there. Morals are, morals are uh, established right and wrong. Values is what price you put on something. And so I don't put any price on my virtue. I don't put any price on my, on my virginity. And so I'll sell it out for whatever reason. And, and so they don't have any absolutes. And, and there are actually in atheistic teachers, many of them in the science profession, who want to make everybody believe that we came from some scum somewhere and they want to totally deny God, amen. And the higher you get in education, especially on the college campuses, there are those there that believe it is their responsibility to belittle every Christian in their classroom and to destroy their faith. Now, oh, well, we should be strong enough to stand for our faith. Well, we should be. But we're not all of us the same. And what you might be able to do, one of your children might not be able to do. Amen. You ought to know your children enough to know what their strengths and their weaknesses are, where they are susceptible and where they're not. I mean, don't just have children, amen, have them and raise them, amen, you know. That's what happens. So many people, they just have children, and it's like, well, I had them, but I don't want to be bothered with them. No, if you're going to bring them into the world, then bring them up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord, amen. Don't bring children in here and leave them to be susceptible to the devil and his tools. One of the things that I believe that are very important is wrong activities. You need to be careful. You just need to be careful. My children didn't go spend the night at other children's house. Just didn't do it. I could probably count on that hand the number of times any of my children got to go stay at anybody's house that wasn't family. Even my own church members' houses. As, as a pastor, I, I, I knew my people pretty well. They were good people, but there were some things that they would allow my children to do in their home that I didn't want my children to do. I can't go in there and run their home. Amen. One of people say, now my child comes here, you can't do that. I don't think, I didn't feel that. So I felt the way to protect my children is just don't put them in that environment. Don't put them in a place where they will be tempted Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Why do we want to place ourselves in the place of temptation? But we do, don't we? And we do it, and then we do it with our children, and we ask, well, how come my, my brother got drinking? Why? Because he was with a bunch of guys who, they were, he was at a guy's house, there was daddy drank, and the beer was in the refrigerator. And so what do teenage boys do that have grown up under that? And my brother should have said, no, I'm a Christian, I don't do that. But, hey, you can condemn and criticize all you want to. If you've never been in that position, amen, don't be criticizing somebody if you haven't walked a mile in their moccasins, amen. 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 It's easy to talk. Talk's cheap, amen. My daddy used to say to me, son, talk's cheap. You know, I want to know what happens when the rubber meets the road, Amen. Amen. So be, don't understand the spiritual forces at work in your children's lives. Well, go with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, if you would. Now, don't fail. Don't, don't, the failure of, of, uh, to begin er, training early, that's a pitfall. The failure to understand the spiritual forces at work in your child's life, that's a pitfall. And then uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and look with me at verse 58, and just one verse. There are a lot of verses we could look at on this subject. But, therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Uh, don't, don't fall into the pitfall of the failure to be a godly, consistent example. That little word always there. Always, always, always. That's talking about consistency. Inconsistency kills children. Well, it was wrong. It was wrong last year, but it's okay this year. Wait a minute. Now, listen. I, I tell parents it's better to have less rules and then stick to them than have a lot of rules and keep changing them. The rules don't have to be real specific. It's better if you have broad rules, like we're going to always do right. 
You're going to do right. If you do wrong, you're in trouble. God rules like you're going to obey. Amen. Broad rules like with my kids, broad rules, you don't ever disrespect your mother. You want to get in trouble with me? I find out you disrespected your mother. Okay? We didn't have a bunch of list of rules. You can't do this, can't do that, can't do that, can't do that. We got some rules that were general, that, that, that they could apply, principles, amen, just like God does. And then we stayed consistent with them, consistent with them. You know, it may not have been bad to have television, may not have been bad to have a television set, may not have been bad to watch some things on TV, but once we decided not to have TV, we decided to stay consistent with it. Because we send messages, don't we? That's like, that's like missing church when you're on vacation. I'm just going to write a hobby horse here. Amen. But you just taught your children something. We go to church every time except when we're on vacation. When we're on vacation, we're camping. We don't go to church. Inconsistency. Amen. I believe in consistency. Amen. I mean, I had rules in my classroom in the public school when I taught. I had rules in Christian school when I taught. Very simple rules, and I stayed consistent. And by the way, also, just throw this in. In your consistency, make sure you, you, you apply them to everybody. God's not a respecter of person. They apply to Johnny, but they don't apply to Susie. I know she's so big. I know she's so cute. It's tough raising girls. It's not so tough raising boys. Because you know what a boy's made out of. What is that? Snail and all that kind of stuff. And you know, you know a boy's armor. You know he's a trouble. You know he got, but that little girl, she's all dressed up so pretty. Got her hair got like a little bow. Daddy. And so she gets by with murder. And you raise a spoiled little brat. Amen. And if she's got brothers, then all their life you're going to hear, she got by with murder. We always got in trouble, and she never got in trouble. Amen. Amen. They're going to say that anyway, even if it's not true. But you ought to be able to.